In this video, we're covering some subjects from chapter four. This is gonna be all about time and temperature abuse, thermometers, and we'll go over a few other things like cross-contamination and the flow of food. So I don't wanna waste any more of your time, so we'll just jump straight into it. First off, what exactly is the flow of food? Here's a picture that represents the flow of food. The flow of food goes like this. Purchasing, receiving, storing, preparing, cooking, holding, cooling, reheating, service. Now, do you always do every single one of these steps every single time? Not necessarily. In some cases, you might prepare, cook, and serve it. Other times, you prepare certain items, you pre-cook certain things, and then you reheat them later. If you're in a place like Applebee's, they will pretty much do all of the awesome, they'll cook all the awesome food, it'll taste great, and then you'll throw it in Chef Mike. When you start out, the very beginning of the process of the flow of food is when you put the order in. You do your inventory, you figure out what you need, and you go on Cisco, US Foods, whatever, type in your order, or you go, whatever, Where, wherever you get your food. It could even be from a local greenhouse or local people, whatever. That's not the point. It doesn't matter where it comes from. The point is that you're buying it, right? So purchasing, purchase your food, they pick the food, they put it on the trucks, and then the trucks come to you. At this point, once the trucks are to you and the food is loaded off the truck, everything else is now your responsibility. It's your responsibility to check and make sure that there was no time and temperature abuse during the traveling process, like having things that should be frozen getting thawed and refrozen, making sure that things like yogurt and milk or whatever are up to temp, and if they're not, it's your responsibility to either send it back or make a judgment call on whether or not you think that it is okay to serve. Now, typically, if it is within the temperature danger zone, send it back 100% of the time. When you get it and you temp something out, say you temp out some yogurt and the yogurt temps out at 55 degrees, well, you don't know if it had just hit that 55 degree mark for the first time within like a 30 minute period, or if it's been sitting on the truck in the hot sun all day in a non-refrigerated environment or something, and it's been 55 for eight or 10 hours. In case you need a refresher on what the temperature danger zone, here's a quick picture for you. Now, after you receive it, what do you do? It comes in off the truck, it's either on a pallet or they bring it in on a hand truck or whatever. Well, of course you put it away. So this shows you that upon receiving the food, there's potential for cross-contamination, especially when it comes to TCS food or PHF, whichever you decide. It's TCS in the book, so I'm gonna use TCS from here on out. What are the three main causes for time temperature abuse? Cooked to the wrong internal temperature, held at the wrong temperature, or cooled slash reheated incorrectly. How do you know if the time temperature abuse has even happened in the first place? Well, for starters, the temperature danger zone is your best friend. In this video, it's gonna be talked about a lot. Most pathogens grow the fastest between 70 degrees and 125 degrees. So there's 40 to 140. That's the general temperature danger zone. But 70 to 125 is like red alert. If you've got chicken that's temping out at 80 degrees, like, yeah, that's something to worry about. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some measures to prevent cross-contamination. First off, use separate equipment for raw or ready-to-eat food. A while back, I threw up this picture. This is a picture of different color cutting boards. A lot of different places have gone to using these cutting boards to make sure to limit cross-contamination. So like a blue cutting board you would use for fish items. A brown you might use for cooked meats, whereas red you would use for raw meat, etc., etc. You can read it, you can see it. Clean and sanitize before and after tasks. So this also includes your prep table. Don't just start prepping on a prep table. You have no idea what was on there. And it's not just cross-contamination between like chicken and shrimp. It could also be a chemical contaminant you have no idea what's on there. Now, that, now these type of chemicals like bleach and stuff should never be on food contact services anyway, but make sure to sanitize it just in case you never know. The next thing that you can do is prep raw and ready to eat foods at separate times. If you've got cooked chicken and raw chicken, don't go over and pan up a tray of raw chicken and then try to come over and slice a bunch of chicken that just came out of the oven. You're gonna get somebody sick doing that. Honestly, there's a way to do it to where you don't get people sick, but I don't suggest it, I don't recommend it because changing gloves, washing your hands, and stuff, it's, it's a big inconvenience. So you're better off just prepping all of the raw ingredients and then cooking it all 
or just doing one task then switching over to the other. Another option, which I don't really recommend it personally, but this is more of just a preference uh, and it also the, the quality can be reduced, is you can buy prepared food. Now, this is anything from pre-shredded lettuce to chicken breasts that are already cooked. A really easy example of this would be to buy frozen chicken tenders that all you have to do is just throw them right in the fryer and they're already basically done. They just need, you just basically need to heat them up, right? Now you can buy raw chicken tenders or you can hand bread the chicken tenders. The question that a manager or somebody in leadership needs to ask is, will the labor be, basically will the labor be worth it? Are, are you someone that is known for your hand breaded chicken tenders? Well, in that case, the labor is worth it. Are you just running them as like a kid's thing? Like you have a bunch of other food and then you have chicken tenders on the menu for kids. Well, are you, do you really need to prep by hand a bunch of hand breaded chicken tenders when they just want regular ass chicken tenders? Like anybody with kids knows sometimes making things from scratch, you're just kind of wasting your time, right? Next thing you can do to avoid time and temperature of use is monitoring. Essentially, the system that you will set up will be every X amount of time, usually about every two hours or so, you'll do temp checks for anything that's hot, anything that's cold or whatever. You can do temp checks in the morning where you just go and you look at all the temperatures of all the fridges and everything and make sure that they're up to temp, which I will tell you right now, you, you think that that kind of sucks to do that every single morning, but there has been times where I've done my temp checks in the morning and I noticed the freezer was running hot and we were able to fix it, like the freezer drawers. There's freezer drawers on, on the cook line and then there's like the freezer in the back. So we were able to pull everything out and get it in the freezer because everything was still frozen, but it had just stopped working. So doing that versus just using the equipment and then you start noticing that, you know, the onion rings are starting to get a little soggy, you know? So you can monitor the temps of the refrigerators and freezers. You can also make sure to monitor the temps of anything you have hot held. It could be anything from chili to whatever. Maybe you're not working as a line cook and you're doing like banquet stuff or you're working in like a university or school or whatever. In those cases, you're gonna have things set up in hotel pans. You're gonna wanna monitor the temperature and make sure that they're not in the temperature danger zone. Make sure you have the right tools for the job. Infrared thermometers to measure the temperature of a flat top or a probe thermometer to make sure that you're measuring the temperatures properly of the chicken or the pork or the beef or whatever. Make sure that you have a way of recording this. It, a really simple sheet, really simple Excel document that has like time, temperature, blah, 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 any notes. So if you had to throw something away, remake something or whatever, you can write those notes. Then you can look at those logs at the end of the week or the manager can look over them and be like, oh, you know, I noticed that regularly, even though that our, our chicken is staying up to temp, I noticed that this isn't working the way it should be or whatever. You can catch them before it becomes a problem. Now, the other thing is to have specific measures in place to make sure that you have control over the time and temperature of TCS food. Really easy example of this. I said in another video that there's a times where I'm trimming like 180 pounds of beef or 80 pounds of whatever. Instead of taking out all 180 pounds and knowing that it's gonna take a while to trim all this beef, I open a case and take out like three at a time or four at a time or whatever. Like whatever I think I can do within like a 30 minute period or 45 minute period. Before it has time to reach the temperature danger zone, then get it trimmed, put it back in there. And then when I walk in with the trimmed meat, I can take more out and you just keep working like that. There are some places, there are some steakhouses that they prep in the walk-in, like uh, Whiskey Creek. I don't know if you have a Whiskey Creek around. I haven't worked there, but I've been told by multiple people that they trim all the meat and they do all the cutting and all that in the cooler. Lastly, corrective actions. Either you or the staff or both, should just be both, should know what to do in what corrective actions to take if something isn't temping out to the right temperature. The simple way to do this is just bring it up to temp. If you're monitoring the temperature and you know that within a two hour period, the first temperature, the soup was 150, but now you've measured the soup two hours later and now the temperature is like 120. So you know that because it's within that two hour window, you can just go throw it on the stove, heat it back up maybe crank the steam table up a little bit more and boom. But then there's other times where you need to temp something out and you gotta throw it away. Like sometimes that's just what you gotta do. Other things for time and temperature abuse is you can look for signs of things being thawed out and refrozen. So things coming off the truck, if they look like they've got like lots of ice on them, a lot of times they thaw it out. You know, chicken, chi say you get a case of frozen chicken breasts. Those frozen chicken breasts are supposed to be glazed and separate from each other. So if you get 
a case of chicken breast and the whole thing is like a solid ice block, probably because it got thawed out on the way over and then it got refrozen. This potentially could be dangerous because you don't know how long it was thawed out for. The four hours that food can be in the temperature danger zone before you have to throw it away, this is cumulatively. This means that the food is in the temperature danger zone for an hour, you are able to cool it down. When, if that hits the temperature danger zone again, now it can only be for three hours. If you get something and it is 50 degrees and it stays that way for two hours, then you're, you manage to get the temperature back down. Now, if it comes back out, you only have two more hours. See how that works? All right, next we're gonna talk about thermometers. You excited? You excited for the thermocouples? Yeah, I'm excited. I can't wait to talk about probe thermometers. We have three main types of thermometers that are covered in the SurfSafe manual. These are bimetallic stemmed thermometers. This is typically what you see on the sleeves or in the breast pocket of most chefs. Thermocouples and thermistors. These are typically the ones where you have a handheld device and then you have a wire going to like a probe or whatever and take temperatures that way. Some places have them, some places don't. Now with bimetallic stem thermometers, you have the manual and the digital ones. In the manual, they talk specifically about the analog ones, not the digital ones. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now underneath, you will notice that there is something that looks like a nut. That is a calibration nut. That is how you adjust the thermometer to make sure that the temperature is always being read correctly. One thing that a lot of people may not know about these types of thermometers is there's only about an inch or two that actually reads the temperature. It doesn't read the temperature all the way up towards the top, just the tip. Just the tip. So what are all the different kinds of probes? We have immersion probes. Immersion probes are more for liquid soups, sauces, stocks, and stuff like that. Surface probes are used for like the flat top griddle. Penetration probes. So with these probes, you penetrate and you take the temperature through penetration. Like chicken and hamburger patties. Come on, get your minds out of the gutter. Air probes. This is to check the temperature of literally the air of like the walk-in in the freezer. There's also infrared thermometers. I talked a little bit about that. That way you, it's just a gun to check the surface temperature of something. You never use these to do things like check things on the cold bar. Usually it'll be like a lot of the same things that you'll use the surface probe to do. When the health department comes, they use their thermometers and they only go down about an inch into the food. So if that top inch is not up to temp, that's all they care about. It's because they know that most of the time, the food on the cold bar, when it gets towards the bottom, it's gonna be fine. But a lot of people, what they will do is they, were, they will overfill these pans, the six pans and whatever. There's a little notch on there. And that notch indicates the maximum you're supposed to fill anything. You have diced ham or whatever you have, not supposed to go past that line because once it goes past that line, you get diminishing returns on the cooling effect of the cold bar. And that's how you end up with a time or temperature abuse situation. Make sure to remove any barriers between the probe and the food. This means don't take the probe and jam it through the plastic packaging into the chicken. You wanna take the chicken out or remove the barrier to do that. And the reason why is because when you do that, you risk a physical contamination of the chicken. And of course, always make sure to follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Also something that people might do on accident is taking the temperature of raw chicken with a probe thermometer and then using that same thermometer later to check the temperature of diced ham. And this, this is a potential for cross-contamination. So it is important to make sure that you are keeping your thermometers clean and you're wiping them down with like, they have like little alcohol pads, wipe those down every time before you take the temperature or something else. When should you calibrate your thermometer? After they've been bumped or dropped, after they have been exposed to extreme temperature changes, before deliveries arrive, before each shift. Also, some things to keep in mind, some thermometers can't be calibrated and they just need to be replaced. Usually this applies to some digital thermometers. Not all, but some. Thermometers that measure the temperature of food storage equipment can be off plus or minus three degrees. Thermometers that measure food can be off plus or minus two degrees. You can only use glass thermometers like candy thermometers if they are in a shatterproof casing to prevent physical contamination. Always take the temperature of something by checking two different spots. So with a chicken breast, you want to check in the thickest part and you might want to rotate the chicken breast 90 degrees or whatever. Find another spot that's kind of away from the thermometer and check it a second time. Always wait for the reading to steady. I mean, obviously, if you take the temperature of something and the it's chicken supposed to be at 165 and it shoots up to like 170, you know that it's it's hot enough. It's usually when temperature when you're trying to see if things are lower in temperature, 
it might stay at the reading that you need, but then after a couple seconds, it'll drop a couple more degrees. So how do you calibrate these thermometers, these analog thermometers? You can use the boiling or the ice point method. So in order to calibrate the thermometer, get water boiling, measure the temperature of the boiling water. If your thermometer does not say 212 degrees or 100 degrees Celsius, then adjust it until it does. Same with the ice point method. This is technically easier and safer and faster. You want to use ice water, specifically crushed ice. You wanna fill the container first with crushed ice and then fill it with water until it's level. Then wait 30 seconds, get the reading. If it doesn't say 32 or zero, adjust it until it does. There you go. Now you know how to calibrate an analog thermometer. Oh, that was that's it, that's the whole chapter. So there you go, that's chapter four, short, sweet, to the point. Remember, as always, at the end of each chapter, I'm gonna have study questions down in the description. So you will have study questions for this chapter down below because this whole chapter only took one video. If you're watching a video and you don't see study questions down below, it's because that's part of multiple chapters. Now, I know that might seem confusing, but that's how life is, so. Uh, next up, we are actually going to talk more about the flow of food in chapter five. They specifically focus more on that. That's why I only touched on it briefly in chapter four. Here's a quick story for you to keep in mind for chapter five. Two people died and 68 people became severely ill after dining at a family restaurant in the Midwest. An investigation revealed that several 10 pound packages of raw ground beef were incorrectly stored on the top shelf in a walk-in. Authorities determined that the ground beef had dripped onto fresh rolls and cartons of chocolate milk that were stored on the shelf below gross, right? Guess who had eaten the rolls or were served these cartons of chocolate milk got severely sick with E. coli. The operation, which had voluntarily closed for the investigation, never reopened. If you are an owner of a restaurant or a manager of a restaurant, not only are you now responsible for all these people getting sick, but now you're out of business and your livelihood is gone. So something as simple as just putting ground beef in the right damn spot is extremely important. So while I know that some of these chapters are boring, this is for Serve Safe Manager and it's also for your safety and for the guest's safety. So just keep that in mind when you're watching these videos. You know, and I'm, I, I know sometimes I got some jokes and my mind's in the gutter, but the purpose and point of these is to help you have a better understanding of food safety and understand exactly how important it is. Let me know how you are liking the Serve Safe playlist so far in the comments below. I love hearing and reading all the comments. And as always, have an awesome and amazing day, and I will see you on the next one. Peace.